Good evening, folks, and um, welcome to my house, to my lounge room, uh, for my sermon tonight. And you know, last week we we didn't really survive very well with Facebook, uh, but tonight I think it's all sorted. And hopefully, you are watching and listening and hearing, and all's good in the world. So um, I've got a sermon tonight. Um, got my notes. I'm just trying to. Now I've got ten thousand things on it. Um, let me. What am I call it? Precious, precious water. That's what I'll call it tonight. I've got all these bits of paper and scratches all over it. So precious water. And um, I want to talk on an interesting subject, a, a little story from um, the Old Testament. And, and I hope that it, um, it inspires you and uh, interests you. I hope my preaching is interesting for you tonight and I trust it is. But I also want it to be a blessing to you and that God will touch your heart. So why don't we, we pray uh, as we commit tonight to God. Jesus, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be preaching on Facebook. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for technology, and thank you, Lord, that we're able to, to extend the kingdom in this way. And Lord, tonight I pray for every single person that's watching that you will touch their hearts, that you will bless them so much, that you'll encourage them, give them the strength to face the Monday mornings that we have, though Monday mornings are public holiday for us. But Lord, you know, just help us, encourage us and strengthen us and bless us, Father God. Bless us so much. And I like what my pastor Gary says. He says, you know, ask God to bless you so you can be a blessing to others. It's not about being blessed for yourself or selfishness. But God, will you bless my life and Bless me, bless me, bless me, so I can be a blessing to those around me. And I hope that's your prayer tonight, and it's a wonderful thing to think about. So God, just come, be with us in this place, and touch every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you for tonight, and thank you for tuning in. And like I said, I'm pretty uh, excited to be back on air. I've had a busy week. Last week, I was um, preaching to the guys in Ukraine. Oh, amazing. I mean... You know, you know the call of God on our lives, mine and Kerry's life. Kerry and mine is more better English. Uh, you know, and we we love Ukraine people, and we love the Belarus, and we love Russia and those eastern countries. And um, we had this Zoom meeting, uh, preaching, and it was so wonderful, and just to see their faces again, so long since we've seen them, and my tears in my eyes, you know. And, and we, we're just waiting to get once those fl flights open up, once the planes start traveling. You know, we want to get over there again for some more ministry. But, you know, it's wonderful that we could connect in that way. So, you know, I keep myself pretty busy and um, I'm doing more preaching than I normally do. And there's more to come. You know, Belarus wants me to do quite a bit and Ukraine wants me to do stuff. And here I am tonight. So, you know, I'm probably preaching more than a lot of pastors would preach, uh, which is fine by me and something I love doing. So anyway, I always ramble, don't I? And Kerry t says that. She tells me sometimes. But tonight, so I'm talking about this... Um, Precious water, and I want to talk to you about this story. You see, there's an interesting uh, record and, and an interesting story about David and three of his men. It's a very simple story to understand um, as we read it. And, and in the passage that we're talking about, it tells a story of three, three of David's mighty men who break through the battle line of the Philistines in order to bring David a drink from the well of Bethlehem. And though David had longed for the water, he doesn't drink it because of the danger the men expose themselves to in order to give it to him. So he pours the water out to the Lord. And that's my sermon. That's it. No, you can't sit down and turn off. No, that's just the introduction. But that's what I'm going to be talking about, this incredible story of David. So in the Bible, there's a similar passage in Samuel. In fact, it's in 2 Samuel. Uh, chapter 23 verses 13 to 17 and you can read the same account of this amazing story i'm waiting for kerry to type away but i want to read tonight from first chronicles uh, chapter 11 and verse 15 
So here we go. Here's, here's the gist of the story. Please forgive my pronunciation of um, these words because I'm not so good at the English. Anyway, now three of the 30 captains went down to the rock to David into the cave of, of Adullam. And the host of the Philistines encamped, encamped in the valley of Rephraim. And David was then in the hold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, that is at the gate. And the free broke through the host of Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem, that was by the gate. And they took it and brought it to David. But that David would not drink of it, but he poured it out to the Lord and said, My God forbid it me that I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men that have put their lives in jeopardy? For with the jeopardy of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things did the three mighty men. And, and that's, the, um, that's the story in a nutshell about this water that was so precious. This water was so precious because of the cost of getting and obtaining this water. Anyway, I, I, will, I will continue on. So it's interesting in this in this account of David. It's I mean it's clear to us, hopefully clear uh, to you tonight in your minds about the, what the story is about. It's a very you know. It's just about these brave men breaking across into the enemy's camp and sneaking in and getting, stealing this water and getting this water to give it to David because somebody had heard him saying how much he had longed for this water. You know, and it's just, there's so much in this story, I, I can't bring it all out because there's so many, you know, items and influences in this story. But you can see here, how much the men loved David. There was David was precious to them. Let's keep, let me keep to the theme of my message of being precious water. Uh, David was precious to these men. These men loved David with all their hearts, and they loved David with uh, with their lives, ready to lay down their lives and die to to please David to bring him this water. Because David only mentioned it and was just talking, you know. And, and these men went out and risked all to bring back this water. So, and it, and it turned this water from being just simple, you know, spring water or well water, you know, that you can buy in Woolies, it turned it into something that was so valuable because of such the cost in getting this water that David couldn't drink it. It would be like, to him, it would be an insult to drink because it'd become so precious. And what do you do with something that is so precious? When something is so precious, you give it to God. It's the only thing to do. It's the only... A good thing to do when something is so precious that we offer it to God as a sacrifice and that's what David did and so this is quite a quite an amazing story of these men and David and it and it reminds me and I have to go back to some little stories in life but um and you might go why where's this connected but it is it is in my brain it's all connected anyway um, but you know when God hears our thoughts these men uh, were gathering around David in in this kind of cave where he was hiding out in his stronghold and, and they heard David's wish David's wishes and they weren't told to do it they just heard it you know just a passing maybe a passing moment as they walked past they heard and then they got together and said oh let's go and do something good for David you know I heard he wanted this and, and off they went uh, to, to fulfill what David wanted and it reminds me about when me and Kerry were missionaries in the Ukraine and um, we had some amazing moments when God blessed us and looked after us. Well, he looked after us and blessed us all the time. But there were some significant times in our lives when we, we said something like David would have said. You know, David said, oh, I wish I could have some water. You know, he was probably feeling hot and thirsty and, and maybe the water around was stagnant and rubbish. And, and he was getting these beautiful memories of the well of Bethlehem. And, you know, he obviously had fond memories. And he was going, oh, you know. And... Um, and these people heard it. Well, you know, first test little testimony is, you know, we were, we were in Russia. I think it was Kerry's second trip. Yes. Kerry's first trip. We were in Russia, uh, and you know, as you know, I always talk about it. It's not a secret. Kerry's health was not good, and she was feeling very sick. And we were in this little uh, unit. Unit. 
apartment, an apartment um, in this little apartment and uh, we we're in Moscow and we were with Taras and Luda. Luda, but Luda and Taras were living in a different apartment so we were separated in different apartments uh, and we didn't know the language and they didn't know English and it was all very confusing and we basically only just flown in and Kerry was just feeling so sick I mean you know if you ever want to see somebody throwing up then you watch Kerry she just <laughs> she goes for it I mean you know phew, it, it makes me just ooh, cringe inside anyway she is just feeling desperately sick desperately sick and I said what can I do to help you know uh, what can we do and Kerry says look all I feel like is is tomato soup because you know she has these little uh, standby foods that she loves to eat when she's feeling rubbish in, in her stomach and so she said, all, I, all I really wish is to have some tomato soup and I went Kerry look I don't know what's happening in this place I don't know what they're cooking for us I, I can't even speak the language they can't speak our language we're in one apartment and they're in another one we're in a big city we've never been to before I said I really don't know what I don't know how I can help I don't know what I can do and um, and we just can we just went on with life you know and um, we didn't pray about it or fast and you know get spiritual we just left it at that then there was this knock on the door and and Luda comes in with this big 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 saucepan of, of stuff and I think Kerry says oh like you know bosh she told me it was soup she Kerry okay I'm, I'm, I'm getting the story from Kerry too she, uh, she told Kerry in broken English it was soup and Kerry went oh lovely bosh because that's all she could think of which would be Russian soup well you know bosh bosh and, and, and the lady said, no, tomat, or tomat, tomat, you know, and, um, which is not the right English, but we, uh, we, we kind of understood what she was saying, we lifted the lid off, and there was this huge big saucepan of tomato soup, exactly what Kerry said, oh, I long for some tomato soup, you know, you know and, and we just spoke those words out, and, and you know, God was watching over, God was watching over, God heard our little comments. He, 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 but she would have made that soup. Long time before, yes, Kerry's there. saying correcting too that this she didn't instantly make that soup, you know, she'd made it be, days before or day before, you know. But that's the miraculous of God, he, he he's out of time and he can organize things all over the place, you know. Anyway, the fact is, Kerry, don't get me sidetracked, Sorry. that the soup was given to us and it was like, God, you're so so wonderful, God. We didn't pray, we didn't, you know, we, we just were making a comment. And bang, it, it, was, it was there, the answer was there, it was incredible. And, and this is what David, it's like what David had, he just you know, mentioned, oh, I wish I had some water, and bang, it was provided for him. Another, another testimony of when we were in Ukraine and we were in the Bible college and uh, we lived quite a poor diet, we ate what the students ate in the college, and, and we hadn't eaten some good meat for quite a while and, and we were like, oh, I wish we could have some meat, you know, we, we just hanging out for some meat. I mean, we lived on some incredible food. Most people wouldn't eat it, but it's all we had. <laughs> and when it's all you've got and you're hungry, you eat it, you know, so that was it. Um, anyway, we were just going, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I'd love some meat, you know, how nice it would be to have some meat and some vegetables and like a normal kind of meal, you know, something normal. And there was a knock on our door and Alex say came into us into the room with this big bowl or big plate full two plates and he says you don't have to come down to tea with the students tonight I, I brought you tea so you can have it in your in your house by yourselves and it was this big meal of rabbit and vegetables oh man that rabbit tasted better than Kentucky Fried Chicken it was the most <laughs> beautiful meal we had for ages and you know what we went Jesus we just love you God, we just love you so much because we didn't pray, we didn't fast, we didn't get all spiritual. All we were saying, we're just talking to each other, saying, oh, I wish we had. And God provided. And, you know, and so I can sort of see where this story comes from, how David was just making a comment about this beautiful water that he wanted to have and have a drink of. And these men heard his call and, 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 and went and... and and fulfilled the request why because they loved him why because they loved him incredibly and you know I want to say that God loves us incredibly God hears our every every think thought <laughs> he, he, he hears our prayers but he hears our thinking he knows our thoughts and and he's watching and hovering over us and he's into wine into our lives and God wants to bless us because we are precious in his sight we are precious people in God's sight 
and God wants to bless us. And it's incredible when just out of the blue, uh, God does that. And we, we had a lot of miracles when we were in Ukraine in those days and uh, remarkable things of like little bits of help here and there and, and significant things really, you know, because God was blessing us so much and we needed it, mind you. We needed to get help, <laughs> but it came. Anyway, let me keep going. So, you know, in this story, there's a bit of um, typology in this story. Now, I don't get into typology like massively and this isn't a night for huge Bible study on typology, but there is a, there's a bit of typology in this Old Testament story. You know, it's a wonderful story of, story of loyalty and, and a devotion to a leader. And these men displayed that love to David and that commitment to please David and, and, and how David responded when he received that precious water that was incredibly valuable. It's amazing. But, um, you know, part of the typology is this, that, um, that David here in typology is like a, a sinner. He's, he's locked away in, in this kind of cave. He's, in, he's um, surrounded by the enemy. He's imprisoned, as it were. So if we ha get this idea that, you know, him being imprisoned, it, it's like a, a picture of a lost man who finds himself imprisoned by sin. So this is typology. Typology can be a little crazy, and you have to kind of stretch the boundaries a bit to get into it. But, you know, it, it's kind of there. So, you know... David is in battle with the Philistines, and the Philistines actually speaks of the world. It's a type of the world. It's the sin of the world and the, and the sin of people. And the Philistines control the water at the well. And David's unable to get that water from the well. So he's, he's in prison, basically. But spiritually, if you want to look at this, it's like a typology of a man who doesn't know Christ. A man who, without Christ, is imprisoned. And the enemy surrounded him, and he can't get to the water of the well of Bethlehem, which actually speaks of Jesus and the living water that Jesus gives us. So that's, that, that's a little bit of typology. David longs for a drink of the water of Bethlehem, and this water is a picture of everlasting life. Okay? It's just interesting. Just, I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. And it's interesting because the water comes out of the town of Bethlehem. That's where the well was, okay? The water. And Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Bethlehem means the house of bread, and it's the town which Jesus came from. So you can sort of see how I'm saying that this well symbolized life from Jesus Christ, you know, that typology thing. And this is the very place that Jesus came from in Bethlehem. And the, the three mighty men, so we, we, you know, we're doing this story of the three mighty men and they, and, and they hear David longing for the, the water of the well. And because of their love, they, they break through the, the enemy's um, lines at, at great risk to their own lives because they could have easily been killed. There was many men of Philistines in, in that situation and they could have easily been killed. And, and yet they, and they, bring it back to, they bring it back to David. And um, if you want to look at the typology... And, and please, this is kind of just like, you know, ideas. It's, it's not, don't set it in theology, don't make it absolute, you know. But, you know, this kind of picture of these three men, these three mighty men who go to get the living water, or the water that's precious, it's like the work of uh, the Holy Spirit in securing our salvation. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit work together to offer us water of life. Water of life. Oh, that's my church. Water of life. And so there's a typology here of this um, idea that these three mighty men kind of represent the work of salvation in our lives, which is brought to us by three persons, three people, but one, the, the Trinity. Interesting. Okay, interesting. Um, later on in the story, David pours out the water pulls out the water and uh, this is a picture of salvation of pouring out of the water so it's quite amazing now let me go on with this a little bit more because this is interesting I think it's interesting anyway and well I'm gonna have a really short sermon tonight because I, you know I don't want to go on forever tonight so it's gonna be really quick so don't go away, don't get distracted and make a cup of coffee and think you've got another hour because tonight's different 
it's going to be very difficult. You see, there's so much stuff in this that is amazing. When David got that water, when he, when he, when the when the mighty men came back to David, and they presented him to this, they presented him this water. David is overwhelmed. This is my story. Okay, my my scriptures. All right. David receives it and he is overwhelmed. He is in, he is in tears as he as he takes hold of this jug of, and looks at this water and starts to consider just how precious this water is. The very fact that his the three mighty men of his army would would risk their lives at a small whim, at David's whim, that without even a direct command from the king, you know, they would risk their lives to go out and just do something to bring David something he wanted, had a fancy for, you know. And David is is overwrought with emotion. As he looks at that jug and he sees that beautiful cool water and the the, you know, the clarity of the pure water, he looks at that water and he's and he thinks, man, this water, I, I could have lost all of my best friends, my strongest men, my, my supporters, my, my warriors who fight the fight with me. We stand shoulder to shoulder in battle and they've, they've helped and protected me and you know, looked after me through battle and won victories with, with the Lord's help. And, and, and he's thinking, man, these guys, they, they did so much for me. So much for me. Here I am in this holdout, in this stronghold, in this cave, you know, surrounded by my enemies. And yet these men did this beautiful thing for me. And he looks at the water and, and I'm sure he's feeling a little thirsty because that's why he wanted it in the first place. And, uh, uh, but he looks at the water and he thinks, man, I, I can't drink it. You know, he starts to bring the jug to his lips to have a little drink. And he, man, I can't do it. He tries again. No, I can't, I can't drink this. How can I drink this water? It is too precious. It cost too much. The risk was too great for me to drink it. You know, he, he's an incredible man because he's not selfish. You know, at that time, he could have gone, oh, great, guys, thank you. You know, he put a couple of ice cubes in my glass for me and pour it out and bring it over and blug, blug, you know. But he is such a humble person. He's such an amazing man, David, that he, he is just, you know, he's just rocked to the core, to think these people, these men, his friends, would go to such a risk. And he, and he just keeps looking at this water. Now, I don't know how long he looked at that water for, but it, it, it would have been some time. He looked and he thought about, you know, can I, can I, can I, can't I, you know, should I, shouldn't I? And, and he's overcome with emotion as he, as he goes over in his mind and recaps in his mind the dangers and the risks. And then, you know, he says, I can't drink this water. I can't drink it. How can I be so selfish and just to drink for my own pleasure, for my own enjoyment, when something is so precious? How can I waste it upon myself? How can I be so, so you know, that way, to do that thing with something so precious? And so he pours it out onto the ground as an offering to the Lord. Now, he wasn't rejecting the water. It wasn't like, oh, God, is that water's shocking, it stinks, you know, it, it, where did he get that from, you know, that smells awful, it's putrid, and pours the water out in disgust. No, he wasn't rejecting the sacrifice the men had, had gone through to bring this water. In fact, he was, he was declaring it that the sacrifice these men made was so holy that this water was so precious that it would be impossible for him to drink it. And the only rightful thing to do with this water that came at such a cost was to present it as an offering to the Lord. Isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing. You see, that water was precious and David didn't want to waste it. I want to you tonight that you are precious you are precious you are precious like that water you might think you're not precious you might think I'm no I'm a nobody you know God doesn't care about me 
But I want to tell you that you are precious to God. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for you. And, and God allowed Jesus to be crucified on a cruel cross to win your redemption because you are precious to him. And how great a sacrifice Jesus made shows you how precious we are to God. And if we are so precious to God, how do we respond to that? How do we respond to that? It's an interesting question, isn't it? How do we respond? David saw this water and reckoned it so precious that he gave it an offering to God. Well, our lives are precious. God sees our lives as precious. And what are we going to do with what we see as precious? Sometimes we don't even think we're precious. And isn't that the truth? Sometimes we don't think, oh God, you know, I'm not that precious. But to God, we are lovely and precious and like diamonds and beautiful. And he loves us and he loves us so much. And sometimes we don't always feel it. But I want to tell us to you tonight that you are precious in the sight of God. And the cost was great for your salvation. And because of the great cost and the great sacrifice makes your life even more precious. Just like that water turned from normal water to precious water because of the great cost, your life also changes into something incredibly precious because you've been brought with a price that was so huge. So then what do we do with us as precious things? <laughs> How do then we, do we respond back to God with that preciousness? Now I want to flick into something a little bit, a little bit different. I've actually gone crazy tonight. I'm, um, I'm kind of merging I'm merging two two kind of thoughts together two kind of sermons together but I want to tell you okay this water that David has was precious and that's the main thing I want you to get hold of the typology stuff's just kind of interesting it's not necessarily absolutely right but it's interesting and you, and there is a lot of old testament typology that, that translates to showing God and Christ from the New Testament. So it is quite interesting, um, but not to get bogged down into that. The thing we need to, to just get hold of is something that was so precious was given an, as an offering to God, back to God. And that's the main thing. And I want to, the main thing out of this tonight, I want to tell you tonight that you are precious. You are absolutely precious. You might not know it, you might not feel it, you might look in the mirror and go, my goodness, oh God, I'm not so good. But to God and to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you are so precious. And you've been brought with a prize, so you are precious. And I want to just give you some thoughts here. These are like little, just little throw outlines, okay? You are precious and honoured in the sight of God. And I want to read you a promise uh, to Israel, to Israelite to the Israelites or to the Jewish people. I want to read you these scriptures uh, which were given to the Jewish people. But, you know, we can, lay, we can lay hold of some of these things. Now, not all promises given in the Old Testament to the Jews relate to us. And we can't, yeah, yeah I'm taking that, you know, I'm a spiritual Jew. No, there, there is differences here. But I think we can glean something out of this scripture. So I'm going to read um, from Isaiah chapter 43. I'll get my Bible. Isaiah chapter 43. I'm going to read quite a, a few scriptures here. Some at verse 1. And then I'm going to sort of just jump a couple here and there. But if, if you watch your Bible and you look at chapter 43 of Isaiah, you'll see where I'm coming from. So in verse 1 it says, But now this is what the Lord says. That's pretty good, isn't it? So it's not what I'm saying tonight. So all that other stuff is maybe my ideas. But this is what the Lord says. Okay, this is, So you need to get your ear open to hear. If this is the Lord saying it, then we need to make uh, note of it and take hold of it. Especially when I'm talking about you being precious. Precious. You're precious people. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've summoned you by name. You are mine. Isn't that incredible? You've been made by God, created and formed by him. And he's redeemed you. You are redeemed. When you're redeemed, you are precious. When you become a Christian, you are precious in the sight of God. You're his children. 
you go into his family. Wow, it's a wonderful blessing. We need to remind ourselves all the time how blessed and how fortunate we are as Christians. We are the redeemed people, precious in the sight of God. And no matter what day you have and what you're going through in life, it doesn't change the fact that you are precious. Nothing can change the fact. You are redeemed and you are precious. If you're not redeemed, you need to be. <laughs> you need to be. Because you are, it's not a nice place if you're not redeemed. But when you're redeemed and part of God's kingdom and brought into his house, you are precious in his sight. He says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, I'll not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. He, God promises protection because he loves us so much, because we're precious in his sight. He promises to protect us and look after us and watch us over us no matter what we go through in life whether we're going through the floods or whether we're going through the fires of life there's this promise of god to watch over us and look after us and he goes on to say in the last bit in verse four why does he why does he give all these uh, promises to the children of israel why why can we take these promises to ourselves as well because he says this in verse four he says, since you are precious and honoured in my sight and because I love you. Isn't that amazing tonight? The word of God, God himself is saying, because it says here, but now this is what the Lord says. This is what God is saying. This is what the Holy Scriptures are telling us tonight. It's not my words. It's not my ideas. It's not my philosophy or thinking. It's what the Bible tells us. Hear it tonight. Hear it again and again and again tonight. And get it into your heart. You are precious and honoured in my sight. You're precious and honoured in the sight of God. Now I have days when I don't feel honoured or precious. In fact, there's many days when I feel unrighteous. And I feel the weight of my sins and, and wonder how God can look upon me. And you, and, you know, that's my human thinking. Because it's not scriptural, because, you know, we have been washed clean of all our sins and we're clothed in the righteousness of God and we're forgiven and we're pure and holy in the sight of God. And God says we're precious, precious and honoured. Imagine that. We are honoured by God. I mean, you can't get it any better. You might not be honoured by anybody else. And nobody else cares about who you are. But to God, you are precious and honoured. Wow, what a wonderful thing. When we're feeling so sinful and so rubbish that we can reflect and say, through Jesus Christ and through the blood of Jesus Christ and his great sacrifice, my life has been cleansed, my sins are forgiven, and I am precious and honoured by God himself. Whoa! What a great thing. What a wonderful blessing. And, you know, we need to tell ourselves this because if you fight this fight that I fight, I often feel so unworthy. I often feel like, man, I'm really not doing the right thing at times. and I'm letting, you know, letting God down and my sinful nature is overcoming me at times. And, uh, you know, I'm not pure and righteous and wonderful as I think I want to be. But in Christ, in, in God, we are just in the... The fact that we live in a sinful world and we are sinful and that's all we can start to see. But if you go through the Bible and the teachings of the Bible, we have to see that God overrides all those things by this incredible act of sacrifice of Jesus who redeemed us, brought us back with a price and covers us with his blood and forgives our sins. So we are, we are white as scarlet. We don't have to then feel rubbish or sinful. Or unworthy because we can come into the presence of God and we say thank you God you've forgiven my sins through Jesus thank you God that you see me as your precious son and precious daughter and that you watch over me and you listen to my heart and you know my life situation see in that picture of David in the cave you know David was he was struggling in a way because he was surrounded by the enemies and he wasn't he wasn't in a palace, he was in a cave, in a dirty place, you know, in a place that wasn't so nice, uh, you know. And yet, 
in that place, in that very place, God kind of heard his voice, the mighty men heard his request and went out and delivered it to him. And that's the same for us. You know, we, we can be in all sorts of situations in life, even feeling like we're held down and captive in a cave and the enemies are all around us. And we are, have no power to have victory or overcome. And yet God hears the smallest thought and the smallest request. He knows our hearts and he knows our intentions. He knows we love him as much as we can love him. But sometimes our sinful nature kind of wrecks it. But he knows our intentions are to love him and live for him and give our lives to him. And he hears our thoughts. And, and because we're precious to him and honoured by him, he, he comes and weaves in these incredible acts in our lives. What else does he say here in, in this verse? Because this man, this is just so exciting tonight to hear. Okay, I'm going to repeat it again. Since you are precious and honoured in my sight, and because I love you. God is saying tonight to you, he loves you. <laughs> he loves you. No matter what condition you find yourselves in right now, uh, you know, if you are redeemed, if you are a child of God, he loves you. <coughs> and we actually know that not only does God love the redeemed, but he loves the sinners. Hallelujah. God sent his son into the world to die for those that were going to be perishing. God's love was so great that while we were lost in our sins, he went out to reach us and reconcile us back to himself. And so God loves every single person. But he, you know, when you're redeemed, there's a special love, I think. You know, we're in the family. <laughs> we're in the family. You know, when you're in the family, you, your mums and dads love you so much. When you're in the family, we've got a you know a big family, and there's a lot of love in the family. It's a great place to be in, you know. But, and when we're in God's family, there's just this incredible love. So I want to tell you clearly tonight: no matter how you're feeling, you might be feeling like you're in the pits, in the cave, uh, with enemies that surrounding you tonight. I want to tell you that God loves you. God loves you, and not only does God love you, but you are precious to Him. Not only are you precious to Him but you are honoured in his sight. And not only that, he hears your thoughts and desires and he is wanting to reach out and to bless you and to touch your life and to help you through every situation. When you go through the waters, he'll be with you. When you go through the rivers, he'll be with you. When you walk through the fire, he will be with you. Wow, we've got some good promises there in, the, in, the, in that Bible. And that's just some really good scriptures. And I'm really pushing this tonight, aren't I? I'm like hot on the trail of this tonight. Pushing, pushing. Um, that we are precious. We are precious. Just like David's water that was received was so precious that it was, it was poured out as an offering to God. Our lives are so precious. You are so precious. You are precious. You are loved. God loves you with all of his heart. Know that tonight. Make it solid in you tonight that you are accepted and loved by God. That you are not, you know, down, frowned upon. You are, God doesn't, you know, uh, walk away from you because you failed him or whatever. God loves, loves and loves and loves you. It's a great thought, isn't it? Now, you are precious and honoured in God's sight. So that's what I've just read tonight in Isaiah. Because... He loves us. That's why you're precious. You're created in the image of God. These are just some one-liners. You're created in the image of God. Didn't I read before about God said he formed us? He formed us. You are precious, honoured, valuable, and important to God. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I, have to, you know, I should nail this on my uh, fridge door or something because I go to the fridge quite often. You know, Just to remind myself, I'm precious, honoured and valuable to God and important to God. I might be a nobody and seemingly unimportant to everybody else in the whole world, but to God I'm special. Ooh, a lot of people actually tell me I'm special, but not in that nice sense sometimes. Anyway, your life has a purpose. Your story is important. Your dream counts. Your voice matters. Isn't this exciting stuff tonight? 
That's how precious we are to God. This incredible preciousness that we are. We are like diamonds and rubies and precious stones. That's how God sees us. He doesn't see us in our sinful, sorrowful state. He sees us as sons and daughters and his love overflows. Can you feel his love tonight? <laughs> Let God touch your heart. I know some of you are going through hard times. I know that. But I want to tell you tonight, God loves you. God loves you so much. You just need to open up your heart to him and receive his love tonight. Let, just receive his love. Let, let it come into your spirit tonight. Start telling yourself you're precious. And your life has a purpose. Your story is important. Your dreams count. Because these things are so important for us in life and they're important to God. And when we have the dreams that God gives us and his dreams become our dreams, there's no stopping. <laughs> there's no stopping us. It's a wonderful journey to be on when, the, when God's heart is your heart and your heart is God's heart and, and your dreams are his dreams. It's incredible. And then you're just in this incredible place. You are born to make an impact. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. These mighty men made a difference. Why? How can I say they made a difference? They just went and got some water and brought it back. The difference they made is they made a story in the Bible that people have been preaching on for hundreds of years. They made a difference because it made a difference to David. As he received that, he was overwhelmed by the courageousness and the act of love. It made a difference to David. And David would have told his children's and children's. And the men would have been held in honour and, and glory for many years. And it made a difference to God because God received an offering that was so precious from the heart of David. You see, there are so many things. God is no respecter of persons. And it doesn't matter what people think of you, their perceptions of you. All that matters is what God thinks of you and who God says you are in Christ. And that's what I've been telling you tonight, that you are loved, precious, honoured, by God himself. You have a calling. And God has already equipped you to fulfill his calling on your life. You have a calling on your life. Never deny that God has called you to something. Now we're all called to different things. And all of us have different jobs to do. And some are bigger jobs and, and others are smaller jobs. But God has got all, something for every single person. We all have a plan and a purpose. And God has something for us. He has equipped you to fulfill his calling. When you were born, when you were formed in your mother's womb, the calling of God and the gifting and enabling of God in your life to fulfill what he gave you to do was born into you. Your DNA, your personality, your talents and all that you have was born into you, sown into you at conception time before you even understood that you had a purpose in life. Before you even understood that God loved you so much, God put in you everything that you needed to live out a life, a glorious life for him. And I'm so excited that God put something in me and put something in Kerry uh, because we're just normal everyday people. We've got nothing of ourselves. But God gave us something, put some gifts into us, put an, instilled his desire into our lives, put a calling into our hearts that we, we reckoned on as we got older. What amazing thing, put in at birth, at conception, installed into our lives. Wow. You have everything you need to fulfill the calling that God has on your life. You have everything. You need to take hold of it and use it. Well, don't worry about what God is doing in other people's lives. Sometimes we compare. Is that somebody said about comparing? Uh, there's two ways you can go when you compare. You can compare people who are better than you, or you feel are better than you, and you will feel inadequate. You can compare people that are worse than you, and you will feel better. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? And often we compare. Sometimes I do at work. I'm very bad. Uh, sometimes I see people working, and they're working very slowly. And I think, you slackers. You know, I can work five times faster than you are and I compare my life and their life. And I shouldn't do it because it makes me grumpy sometimes. I think, come on guys, work a bit harder. Well, they get paid by the boss. I don't pay them. And, you know, it's not my place to say anything and I shouldn't even think it. So, hey, don't compare. Don't compare. Because when you compare, 
It'll either make you feel better, superior, or it'll make you feel worse. And it's all rubbish anyway. So don't compare. Don't worry about other people's lives. Don't worry about what other people are doing, what they're saying, whether they're doing good things or bad things. Don't worry about it. I, actually, I love... I'm going, oh man, I said I'd be finished so quickly and I'm not. I, I love what Apostle Paul said when he was in jail and, and, and the disciples came to him and said, Paul, there's people out there preaching, uh, like taking your glory, you know? And he says, I don't care. As long as people hear Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel. See, he didn't care about what other people did. Wow. Sometimes we get so focused on other people. We need to focus on what God is doing in your, in your life. And you need to focus on your relationship with him. So when you stop looking at other people and, and just consider your own life and your relationship with God, then everything will fall into place. And, you know, if you don't feel precious in the sight of God, if you don't feel loved by God, if you don't feel forgiven by God, if you feel shame and dirty and sinful, you're never going to enter into a proper relationship. You're going to not enter into a proper relationship. I could talk another a whole sermon on the prodigal son and the second son that never had a relationship with his father as well. But that's another story for another time. I want to tell you it's so important that we realise that we are loved, that we are precious, that God cares for us so much. When we know that, we will have the right kind of relationship with God. Because when you start to understand how much God loves us and me and you, then you respond back to God in love, don't you? I'm always thanking God for his love to me. It, it overwhelms me when I think that God can love me. Me, just rat bag old Tom. You don't see me at work sometimes. You only see the good part of me when I'm preaching. You know, but God loves me. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. I can't make it happen. I can't make God like me more than somebody else. God loves me because he loves me. God loves you because he loves you. And we've been, all of us have been brought with such a precious price that we have become this precious thing. Just like that water was so precious. When God promotes you, I love this, when God promotes you, no one, not even the enemy, can demote you. I love it. We've seen, me and Kerry, we've seen some promotions, eh, Kerry? Mm -hmm. Not in the big glitzy stuff, but we've seen how God has blessed us and lifted us up. You know, we have such open doors in Ukraine and Belarus. It's amazing. So many churches that are happy for us to visit. I mean, it's amazing. God promotes us. Mm -hmm. I mean, God promotes us. Not even the enemy can stop it. I love that. Oi. Oh, can you hear me? No. I like this too. Listen to this, because this is cool. This will help. It helps me, as long as I get my brain into it. What looks like a rejection, a closed door, is actually God's way of redirecting you towards the path of your destiny. Do you like that? Come on, Kerry, do you like it? Mm -hmm. Let me read it again. What looks like rejection, a closed door, is actually God's way of redirecting you towards the path of your destiny. And you know, sometimes, man, when you get closed doors, closed doors, closed doors, it can be really hard at times. And me and Kerry, we've, we've hit a lot of closed doors in our life, especially concerning missions. A lot of closed doors. Lots and lots of closed doors. And yet, through all those closed doors, we ended up in Russia. We ended up in Ukraine. We ended up in Belarus. We ended up in this incredible ministry called Water of Life. We've been, we've incredible friends and, and Pastor Alexei and Pastor Moses and you know we have an incredible thing happening and in Ukraine especially. Do you know we're building a church right now in Ukraine? We're smashing into the ground. We're building a church. It's going to be a lovely little church for that community. Hallelujah! Because of closed doors. Because you know before that, me and Kerry were, we wanted to go to China. We wanted to go to to. Africa, we wanted to go to Vietnam, and God closed the door, closed the door, closed the door. And then when he opened it, man, we've, we've had open doors. We've had open doors. Okay, God will shift things 
shake things up in your life just to get your attention and get you back on track. God will do it. Sometimes when you're going through those shiftings and shakings in life, they're really difficult. They're hard to grasp. They're disturbing emotionally and mentally. Sometimes they're physically hard. But I want to tell you, when things go like that, God is shaking to cause attention. Through this whole COVID thing, God could be seen to be shaking the nation and people should be focusing them on God. I mean, we live in such a sinful, sick world that they're not. But they should be. When earthquakes and volcanoes and pestilences and famines, they're the shakings. They should be seeking God. But we know people are so sinful, they won't seek him. But some will. And it's good if you seek him. So you can fulfill the purpose he has for your lives. You serve a mighty and awesome God, an all-powerful and all-knowing and all-present God. That's who you serve. When you're on God's side, all things are possible. You are unstoppable. And the scripture goes on to say, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Wow. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I like that. I, I didn't write those things, but man, I love them. I think they're fantastic. Now, let me just close with this. And I'm right on the ball, aren't I? I thought I was going to be finished in 10 minutes. I'm right on the ball. Okay, life is not to be wasted. Life is not to be wasted. You see, you might have thought that David's water, when it was poured out onto the ground, was wasted. But it wasn't. It was a beautiful offering to God. A beautiful sacrifice to God because of its preciousness. And when something's so precious, then we need to offer it to God. Our lives are precious. I said that tonight. God loves you. He calls you precious. Man, I've heard other people going, hello, precious. And they don't mean it in that sense, do they? <laughs> hello, precious. That's what you say to your wife sometimes, and you don't really mean it. <laughs> well, other people do. I don't do it. I don't call Kerry precious. But some people call their wives precious and don't really mean precious. Kerry is precious. She's great. But we are precious. We're loved by God. And so our life, shouldn't be wasted we shouldn't waste our lives what are you doing with your life what are you doing with your life don't waste the preciousness of your life to fulfilling your selfish ideas and desires if david could have drank that water it would have been a waste in selfishness wouldn't it would have been and we can't waste our lives because we are precious as well and we've got to get all this stuff into our brains and into our hearts and into our spirits that we are precious and God's got stuff for us to do and given us all the tools to do it. Let me leave you with this last scripture. Okay. So we are, I'm, I, have I convinced you tonight you're precious? Come on, you're precious. God loves you. God loves you so much. I hope you're convinced. Now that you're precious and you understand that, this, let me read you this scripture. It's just like, you know, there's, there's, um, there's always a catch, isn't there? In something. <laughs> Some of us are so good to be true that they're not true. This is a catch, but it's not a bad catch. But let me let, read you at Romans chapter 12 and verse 12. Oh no, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. That makes more sense. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, we've been talking about God's love, how precious we are. That's God's mercy. That's God's mercy. That God would love us when we're not lovable. That God would forgive us when we're not forgivable. That's the mercy of God. God loves us. That's the mercy of God. In view of God's mercy, so in regards to God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. What David did with that water as he poured it out onto the ground was true and proper worship to God. He offered to God something that was not just water, but something that was incredibly, incredibly precious. 
He did what was true and proper worship. You are precious in the sight of God. You need to be a living sacrifice. Offer your bodies. Because it's only the true and proper worship for you to do. You need to do this. I want you to do this. I want to do this. Why? Because we love God. Not because we have to, forced to do it, but because we love God. And because we love him so much, we want to love him back. The only way we can love him back is to offer ourselves to him. We've got nothing else to give God. He doesn't care about money. He's not looking for a drink of water. But we can offer ourselves. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. That's wonderful, isn't it? It's such a challenging. I mean, this scripture, I know, every Bible student knows this scripture. They are taught this scripture way early in Bible school. You know, it's just one of those things they, they preach, preach, preach. Um, but it's so powerful. We are precious in the sight of God. We are like that precious water that David poured out as an offering and sacrifice. And we also need to pour out our lives. We need to pour our lives out. You know, we're not going to sacrifice ourselves on an altar and, you know, set off goats and all that sort of stuff. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to be living sacrifices, not dead ones. <laughs> we don't have to jump off bridges for Jesus. You know, We're called to be living sacrifices, but we're still called to be a sacrifice. And we need to be able to pour out our life to God. Give him our life. Give him our, our dreams. Give him our goals give him your money your finances give him your time give him your life just give god your life and let god have your life pour it out to god as an offering you know i have all these wonderful crazy ideas of life and what i want to do in life and you know i constantly come back every week at least once or twice a week i come back and say god you know all the crazy things that i want to do all the wonderful adventures, exploring the trips, missions, all things. You know, all things that I want to do and accomplish in life, but I lay them all down at your feet so that my life can be poured out as an offering to you so I can do your pleasing and acceptable will. Because that's what I want to do with my life because God loves me so much. All I can do is respond to give an offering. And the only offering I can do is offer myself offer myself praise God I can't say any more tonight God loves you you're precious you're like that precious water will you pour your life out as an offering to God will you serve him and love him because as you do you will receive more of his love you won't run out of love it's amazing the more you love God and understand God's love, the more love flows. <laughs> you, just, you, know, you, never, you never get to the end of God's love. He just keeps pouring love onto you. Our only option is to give our lives to him because we're precious. We are precious. If we're of no value, it make no offering, but because we're precious in his sight, then we can give him back something that is so precious, which is our life, our time, our energy, this mortal body has only so long to live and we can give that to him. Amen. Thank you for watching tonight. I'm finished right on core. Man, I thought I'd be finished in 15 minutes when I first preached, but that's how it goes with me. You've got a crazy man here. Anyway, God bless you. I love you. I hope you felt the love of God tonight. Take some of those things I've said, write them on your wall, You know, put them on the fridge, put them on the toilet door. Get them into your spirit tonight because it's so powerful. And I'll see you again. Bye.